In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. As I uh, share you this amazing message, this word with your children that you've given me, I pray that you, I ask you to help me, Holy Spirit, to communicate what you want me to communicate. Blessed through the power of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I want to uh, last last uh, Sunday I shared three important things that uh, I encourage every one of you to put to work. Just quick, I want to point them out so that you can take note of them. Three important things you must do. I use the word you must do. Amen. You must do. They are a must to live a successful, victorious Christian life. So there are three factors for success. If you're going to be walk this journey of Christianity and be a success. These principles are from the scriptures. And I said the first one is meditation. Meditation on the word of God. You have to learn to meditate. You have to. Meditation. The Bible says in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he says, but this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. Not depart from your mouth means you keep talking it. Keep saying it. You shall meditate on it day and night. Day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. You notice, it says good success. There is such a thing as good success. Because the Bible tells us, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. So God wants you to have good success. And through the power of meditation, you're conditioned to function in a path of prosperity. Good success. So when you meditate, you don't meditate and then try to find out what to do. Meditation will cause you to do that which God wants you to do. You watch out for the purpose of doing. Thou shall observe. Bible says that meditate on two things. Give yourself. That's Book of First Timothy chapter four, verse uh, chapter four, verse fifteen and sixteen. He says, "Meditate on two things," and he says, "Give yourself entirely to them." Amen. Not part of yourself. He says, "Give yourself entirely to them," and he says, "If you do, your progress will be evident to everybody." Your progress, which means. The, the King James says, Thy prophecy shall appear to all. These are principles that if you put to work, you cannot fail in your work with God. Amen? He says, Meditate on two things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident, which means you will experience progress. Then verse 16 it says, Take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. And he says, By doing so, you will save yourself. It, it says, Not only yourself, but even those that hear you will be saved. And, and I have sh shared with you before that we are saviors from Zion. Not savior, but saviors. That's what the Bible says. So you are an answer. Meditation will make you an answer. 
to those that are hurting, to those that are afflicted, an answer to your family, an answer to your generation. The Bible says David served his generation. David, after he served his generation, fell asleep. Hallelujah. So meditation is so important. Bible says, blessed is the Lord, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit within its season, whose leaves also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Shall prosper. Did you hear that? He says, everything you do will prosper. This is why I want you to learn to meditate. It is the avenue through which information becomes revelation. We live by revelation. Amen. That sounds one, first one to three. So the second thing I said was you have to pray always. The Bible tells us pray without ceasing. Jesus said specifically in Luke chapter 18 verse 1. He says men ought always to pray and not to faint. I said, if you're not praying, you are on life, life support. You cannot win in life. No matter what anybody tells you, we have seen people who are billionaires that have hanged themselves. Life became a mystery to them. They had all the money in the world. I heard of a gentleman who gave his heart to Christ. He was very rich. He so much pursued the prosperity of this world and he bought two planes, put his names on them. That was, so that when he flies, he could see his name on the on the those big jets. You see. But he did not, he was not satisfied. There was something missing in his soul. Something was missing. And he couldn't find out where he was. He go to know the Lord later. And he wept when he was giving the testimony. He said, I wish I had known Jesus earlier on. He said, I spent most of my years trying to make it in life. Running after money. The pleasures of this world. He said, but I did not And he found his fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. We have the best gift the world in, in, in this world. Amen. That's Jesus. Your relationship with the Lord. Treasure it. Amen. Treasure it. The best thing you will ever have. Can it jealous? Amen. Don't be swayed away by things that don't bring him glory. The Bible says we were created for glory. Amen. Everything you do bring glory to God. Amen. So prayer in the book of James, chapter 5, verse 13, he says. Is anyone among you afflicted? Let him pray. Let him pray. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. So I'm showing you a secret out of trouble. Praise God. And uh, the third one I said, first one was meditation on the word. Second was prayer. Third was giving. Giving. Practice. This principle. Giving. Hallelujah. Is a key to our financial blessing. The word of God shows us that we give. One of the reasons that I share with you, we give because we love the Lord. Amen. The Lord, the reason God gave Jesus was because He loved us. He loved us so much that He gave. His only begotten Son, Jesus, that anybody that believes in Him should not perish, 
not have everlasting life. So we give because we, don't, we love the Lord. The Bible also lets us know that we honor God with our offering, with our giving. In the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of your increase. So thy part shall be filled with plenty, and your fat will overflow with new wine. And that represents the new wine represents the anointing. You see that? So that give will cause the blessing. And uh, Ezekiel actually, Ezekiel chapter uh, 30, for the of verse 30, he says that we should bring the, the first fruit. Amen. And and our oppressions is that we bring them to the priest. That it may cause the blessing to rest on your home. He didn't say pray and it will cause the blessing. He says that your giving will cause the blessing to rest in your home. Amen. So we have to learn this dynamics. He said that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you have no room enough to receive. The Bible shows us in the scriptures that there was an individual who told I was a prodigal son. He asked his father to divide his inheritance and give him what belonged to him. And he gave, gave him what belonged to him and he walked away. He went to a far country and spent everything. And the Bible says that he spent all that he had on writers giving and no man gave unto him. He spent everything and then he found himself in a predicament. And spent it all. So when he was filming in the land, he was starving. And the Bible specifically tells us no man gave unto him. Amen. These are principles. This is what the word of God says. So what do we do? We act. We act on these principles you, so you can practice the word of God and watch your life transfigured, translated from one degree of glory to another in increasing measure. Amen? So you, the word of God works. You can put it to work and see. That's why he, told, he tells us in the book of Malachi 3, he says, test me. God is not afraid. He says, test me. And see. Test me and see. Amen. Praise God. I, I was speaking very fast because uh, we looked at some of those, so I didn't get to show you the scriptures. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But uh, take note of what I've just shared with you. And uh, today I have approximately 30 minutes. But I want to talk to you about walking with the Lord. Amen. Walking with the Lord. Walking, walking with God. Let's use that title. Walking with God. Walking with God. I, I, I've said to you before, I've said to you before that uh, one of the reasons, uh, pay attention to this, okay? I've said to you before that one of the reasons after we got born again, we were not taken into the meridian, or we were not carried away out of here. It was because, for two reasons. The reason we were left here was to win souls and to train for the spirit life. Two reasons. We were left here to win souls to tell others about him. We are ministers of reconciliation and to train for the spirit life. So, which means we are being trained. See, when you understand this, you understand how important it is to be in church, to be in the presence of God. That after you've gotten born again, you find a good Bible-based church and you become a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the training begins there where you're trained in your walk with God. 
your trade. See, when you are, when you go to the gym, you exercise, you work out your physical body, so you can become physically fit. But you know the Bible says that God physical exercise profits little. Amen. It is godly exercise that is profitable unto all things. I believe that's in uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7. Godly exercise is profitable unto all things. So there's a training that you ought to have. To be trained on how to walk with God. And you see, when you yield to that training, the magic of the Spirit, and you become sensitive to the voice of the, the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, the dictates of, of, the, of the Word of God. The mistakes you, have, you would have made when you're older, you make them then. Amen? And the Spirit of God corrects you, gives you insight, guides you, shows you where to go, what to do. And then you'll notice you're coming into perfection. You know, perfection is a word that terrifies many people. We've been trained, we've been told all our lives that no one is perfect. No one is perfect. So we are trained to accept our imperfections. But in the scriptures, God never said that perfection is impossible. If I say that, in fact, God spoke to Abraham and he said, Abraham will appear to him. In Genesis chapter 17, he says, I am God Almighty. He says, walk before me and be perfect. She wanted Abraham to be perfect. Perfection is at different levels. Perfection means flawless. You can grow into perfection. Jesus himself said, Be thou. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, I believe. Be thou therefore perfect. Even as my Father in heaven is perfect. The Father, heaven and Father. Bible says Job was an upright man. There was a man in the land of Uz in Job chapter 1, verse 1. Perfect. Upright and perfect man. Man that feared God and should evil. That he was a perfect man. This is the Bible says. Praise the Lord. So we've got to learn these things and begin to walk in them. Become purposeful. Become conscious. Have an intentional commitment. That's what discipleship is. It's the process of becoming like Christ. Discipleship is the process of becoming like Christ. So you have to make an intentional commitment. Decide to grow. Make an effort to grow and persist in growing. And that takes discipline. It takes learning. It takes yielding yourself, the purging of the Spirit, the instructions of the Word of God. You hear God's Word and put it to work. That's how the glory of God is revealed in your life. Praise God. So just briefly, we have a few minutes. I want to talk to you about how working with God. And we'll use just uh, two Bible characters. To individuals in the scriptures that the Bible references for us that they walked with God. They walked with God. They had such deep fellowship with the Lord that God testified about them for us in the Bible. Left their testimony. So we can learn from them and act accordingly. Because remember, the Bible tells us in the book of uh, 
uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. I'll just share as the Spirit of God leads me. So you can help me, brother, just display the scriptures on the screen. Amen. So as I speak to you, uh, you can see the scriptures. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it tells us, Be ye not forceful. Another translation says, Don't be uh, sluggish, don't be lazy. It says, But be followers of them which through faith and patience inherit the promises. Be ye followers. The word follower there is mamitus in the Greek. He's not talking about following like I'm following somebody behind their back. No, he's talking about imitators. He said, like imitate them. Follow them. Copy their example. Be not trustful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So God documented. This means testimony, so we can learn from them and get to know how to walk with them. Because this man walked with God. Amen? He walked with God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And one of such individuals is Enoch. Enoch. In the book of uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God to him. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God in such a way, he had such a deep fellowship, such communion with the Lord, that God literally carried him out of here. The man ascended. He ascended. The Bible specifically says that he was not found for God to kill. She was not worthy of death. Death had no power over a man. Death had no power Is it possible for you to walk with God, walk with the Spirit of God in such deep, intense fellowship that you enjoy His translational power over sickness, over disease, over death, over all the forces of darkness, over any kind of destruction or weapon that the devil throws at you? Yes. Yes, you can. The Bible shows us you can. Because the book of uh, the Fisher chapter 5 verse 17. He says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, he says, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. And the other translation says, shall reign as kings in life. So God wants it to reign. Through Jesus Christ, we have received abundance of grace. We have received the gift of righteousness. He says, God wants you to reign. Reign over sickness, reign over death, reign over the forces of darkness. Remember, Enoch lived in the days of, in the generation of Adam. A generation where sin had crept in. And as a result of Adam's sin, death was passed upon all men. Because the Bible tells us that death reigned from Adam to Moses. It did not say that death reigned from Adam to Jesus. It says death reigned from Adam to Moses. 
even after them that had not seen. I think we have that scripture there. Let me show that to you in the book of Romans chapter 5. Verse 12. Let's read verse 12. Look at it. It says, Wherefore, as I one man see, as I one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So it was as a result of Adam's sin that death passed upon all men. Sin is what brought death into the world. And, and look at the next verse, verse 14. The Bible says, death reigned, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, which is the figure of him that was to come. So death was reigning. So men were dying, dying of sickness, dying of disease, dying of failure. They were living as victims of death, living as defeated people. Because see, death is not just the cessation of biological life. Death translate, it represents sickness. Disease, defeat, failure, or destruction. So men were dying. Men were afflicted. Men became victims of circumstances. Only those that were working with God, that were in a covenant with God, were separated from the power of death. Death had no power over them. Death could not touch their bodies. Could not destroy their, their pieces. Because of walking with God. And the word of God gives us insight actually on how Enoch walked with God. The word gives us insight. In, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, he says, By faith, Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. Look at it. By faith, Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. But before his translation, this is amazing. A man walked with God in such a way, in such a deep fellowship, such communion, that he was translated that he should not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. But before his translation, listen, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. And the Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you want to please God? You will walk by faith. Walking with God means you've got to walk by faith. You have to walk by faith. It is a law. Faith is a law. In the realm of the Spirit, Without faith, it is impossible to walk with God. Impossible to walk with God. What is faith? The Bible gives us a clear definition in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. The best definition there is about faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Did you notice that? It's now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It's a title deed. Faith is a title deed of things hoped for. Faith is now. 
He says, look at the next part, the part, the next part of the verse. Says, the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Which means faith is the evidence of unseen realities. Faith calls real that which is not perceivable with your five senses. You see that? So, faith transcends the realm of reasoning and the mind. This is why I like to define faith as the response of the human spirit to the word of God. Faith is the response of the human spirit to the word of God. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us when you read the book of Romans, how does faith, how do we get, how do we get faith? By hearing. Romans 10 verse 17, it says, faith cometh by hearing. Okay? And hearing the word of God. So, the more of the word of God you hear, the more faith you get. But it's not enough to just hear God's word. You've got to act on what you have heard. So, you hear God's word. You receive that word into your spirit. You endorse it and act accordingly. Let us be that generation that will live by the word of God. And that's how you walk with God. Don't be calm. The kind of generation that God addressed when he was talking through the prophet uh, Ezekiel. He said, son of man. He said, these individuals, he pointed them out for them. He said, they talk about you in the in their war behind the walls, in their houses. They know you are a man of God. The word of God is in your mouth. And they say, let us go and hear the word of the Lord. And then they come like other people and they sit and they hear, but they don't do. Look at it. I think it was, we have that. Let's say, go check the first. Go ahead and read it. I want you to read it for yourself. One, two, three, go. Uh -huh. The children of your people are talking about you besides the walls and in the doors, the doors of the your houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word of the Lord is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do, they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Look at this part. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice, can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. That's what God said. He said, God was saying that. And he told the prophet, he said, these people, they are playing. When they come before you, they smile. They said, let's come and hear the word of the Lord. They hear, but when they walk away, they do nothing about it. He said, it will come to pass that they will know a prophet was among them. Like in the days of Noah, he brought a message from the Lord. They thought there was a game. They thought, was, they thought it was a story. But when the, the flood came on when Noah in his generation was separated from affliction. Everyone perished in the waters because they did not heed the word of the Lord. The things I'm sharing with you are by the Spirit. The Lord is talking to you. Let the word of God become personal. Amen. God has chosen you to hear these words. Hallelujah. To act according. That's how you walk with God. For example, the Lord appeared to Abraham. 
You receive the word. You hear the word. You endorse it. You act on it. You live by the word. God appeared to Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter 15. And I'm just showing you how to walk by faith. Because walking with God is a walk of faith. God appears to Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter 15, I believe. And he says to Abraham, he says, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. He said, Abraham, he said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Abraham said, he explained to him, he said, Lord, what will you do for me seeing that I have no child? And the store that I have in my house is the answer of Damascus. He said, what will you do? He says, I have no child. He's talking to God. He said, I don't have a seed. He said, the one that I have is one that is born in my house. He's the one that is going to become my heir. God said, that one that is in your house it's not the one who's going to become your heir. He said, your heir will come out of your own body. He said, you can read it. It's over there. He said, your heir, your seed will come out of your own bowels, your own body. And then he said to Abraham, he said, come, come up. He called him out of his tent. He said, I want you to lift, lift your hands, to lift your eyes toward heaven and count the stars. Count the stars. And Abraham lifted his eyes toward heaven. He said, Lord, there are many. He said, yeah. He said, that's how many descendants you will have. The Bible says, look at it. Verse, the last verse. And Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. God spoke a word. The man believed. So he goes further, he says to him, and so Abraham says, Son, he said, Walk thou before me. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. He said, Walk and God Almighty. He said, Now walk before me and be perfect. He says, the next one, he says, Your name will no longer be called Abraham. Which means exalted father. He said, Your name will no longer be called Abraham. That, that's verse, verse, verse 5, I believe. But Abraham. Because I have made you a father of many nations. So he said, He changed his name. Because Abraham means exalted father, assumed father. He says, Your name will no longer be called Abraham, but Abraham which means father of many. But the man, listen, the man had no child. And so Abraham walked by faith. He functioned with the consciousness that he was the father of many nations. He was settled because God had said it. He walked in the, according to the text of the word of God. He walked in the consciousness that he was the father of many nations. How do I know? Because the Bible says in the, in the book of Romans, okay, you go to the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, as it is written, look at it. Maybe I should go through this slowly so you can catch this. This is important for your life. It says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and he correth those things which be not as though they were. Is that so? He's showing you the God, the character of a God that Abraham believed. He says he's a God who raises the dead. And he calls those things that be not as though they were. The challenge here is many people don't accept what God has said of them. 
they struggle to accept what God has said. Like what we were talking about, perfection. They struggle to accept it. God says, you are a king. You are a priest. You are the embodiment of my wisdom. Christ in him, the hope of glory. Bible says, he's a God who raises the dead. He said, I have many things. Notice, he did not say, I am going to make you a father. He said, I have, but the man had no child. I have made you a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, quickeneth means make alive. Who quickeneth the dead and calls all things that be not as though they were. He calls real the things you cannot perceive with your natural senses. And then the Bible, look at the next part. You see, it is this. Against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. Do you notice? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So, it says, against hope, he believed in hope. Which means, the situation was hopeless. The circumstances were hopeless. Are you in a situation in your life right now where it seems as though it is hopeless? He says, who against hope believed in hope? So this means cast the Abraham casted himself on Jehovah. The word of God became his reality. That was his way of life. This is your truth. Against hope, he believed in hope. That he might become that which God said, the father of many nations. And the Bible says that he considered not his own body now dead. Look at the next part of the verse, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, remember, walking with God, you're walking by faith. It's a walk of faith. It's a being not weak in faith. He considered what his own body now dead. Listen, the man, you just read it over there in verse 17. The man was a hundred years old. His wife was 90. Past the age of childbearing. The Bible says that her womb was dead. But Abraham knew the God he believed. He's a God that raises the dead. Whether it's a dead womb, a dead business, a dead body, he's a God who raises the dead. It is never too late for God. This is why people marveled when he showed up at the tomb of Lazarus. And they said, the man has been paid for four days. Martha said, Lord, by now, there is a stench. This man smells. Jesus said to Martha, did I not tell you that if you will believe, you will see the glory of God? He said, I told you, he said, Roll a stone. And then they pull that stone off the cave. And he looked toward the heavens. Lifted up his words. He said, Father, I thank you because you have heard me. He said, But because of these that are standing here, I say it is that they may believe. He said, Let us come out. The power of his words pulled that man out of the grave that was bound. The power pulled the man that was dead out of the grave. 
and made him stand straight. And Jesus said, and die him and let him go. That's the God we have believed. You have to know him. You have to know him. This should become personal revelation. When this gets in your consciousness, no one will push you to serve God. No one will push you to pray. No one will push you to go to church. God can use you single-handedly to turn the city around. The Bible says John the Baptist was eating wild honey and locusts. He was wearing Leka protection takara pratisha. Glory to God. Camel's hair. He didn't do any kind of advertisement. But the Pharisees, they were running to him to him in the wilderness. People were running from the whole city to hear a man that was eating animals. He looked weird in their generation. But the Bible says he was full of the Holy Ghost. The move of the Spirit that is going to spread out in one circuit is by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Don't see with your natural eyes. God is moving. He's moving. Our prayers are not in vain. Incense is arising in the nostrils of God. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Be not weak in faith, consider not his own parting out date when he was about a hundred years old. Neither the tenderness of Sarah's womb. Do you see what faith is? It does not consider the circumstances. Okay? It doesn't consider the circumstances. It doesn't consider how much money you have in the pocket, whether you have or not. It doesn't consider the condition of your children, the condition of your family, the condition of your finances. It doesn't consider the doctor's report. Look, he says, be not weak in faith, consider not his own body now dead. Neither the tenderness of Sarah's womb. Say this, faith does not consider the circumstances. But we will look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which you can see with your natural eyes are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that he stuck at not. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? The Bible says he stuck at not at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He stuck at not. He did not waver. Which means he took a hold of the word of God. In the midst of staggering circumstances, staggering situations, he focused on the child Isaac. The promise. And the Bible says that he was being fully, was fully persuaded what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Are you convinced that what God has said will come to pass? I believe it. I believe that what God has said will come to pass. I saw a crusade of there were not millions. I saw it here in America. And I was preaching to them. That was not by accident. The Holy Spirit single-handedly chose to pick that and show me the future. I saw it. I saw white, Spanish, black, washed.
worshiping God. God allowed me to enter into the future and see it. I don't see with natural eyes. That's why I, didn't motiv- I don't need anyone to motivate me to pray. I don't need anybody to motivate me to preach the word, to share the word, to witness. If you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, He can use you. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't say that one is not going to church, I'm not going. Don't say to me, this are not to me. No, when you stand before God, you'll be by yourself. But this is the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. That we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account of the things done in the body. Amen? We'll give an account of what we have done in the body. That's why I push you to win souls. And this year, I believe God wants to do bigger, bigger things with us. We have to stretch like never before. It's a year of consecration. We've got to offer him spiritual sacrifices. We are living stones, with lifeless stones, the Bible says. We are called to offer him spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable unto him. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to stop here. I, I, I was still going. Amen. Glory to God. Are you getting blessed? Yeah. Hallelujah. I, I'm going to stop here. I will add on next, next week. Amen. So, Make sure you're here. Hallelujah. And bring your friends and family with you. Glory to God. And the glory of God will remain in your life. Stand on your feet.